If you, would, if you would turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, um, it's our last Sunday of the year, and, um, and so what I want to talk to you about this morning and possibly next week is um, very basic and simple, trust God, don't look back, press forward. Trust God, don't look back, press forward, okay? And, um, and just to encourage you um, a little bit this morning at our, at our morning study at the 9.30 this morning, we actually had a great time and, and the folks encouraging one another, you know, about what they've learned, about what they are learning and, and about, you know, how much it means to them to understand the Word and wh- how much great comfort there is in, in the peace of God and and to talk about the glory of God. And we had a great time out here this morning encouraging one another because we want to exhort one another. So I want to um, share with you this morning um, to, to really, really just, just trust God, to believe Him, believe His Word, believe what He says. Because honestly, God, as we said before, He's not a liar. He's not a man. Men lie, not men, mankind lies, and that men, men lie too, I guess, but um, mankind, ma- mankind uh, uh, man lies, but God does not lie, it's impossible for him to lie, you know, God cannot lie, he's God, and God puts in his word, and he gives us some promises, and he gives us some, some sureties in his word, and he tells us what he is doing, what he has done, he's telling us what he is doing right now, and he's, gonna, he's telling us what he's going to do, and the answer for anything and everything that we face, have faced, are facing, and will be facing, is the Word of God, ultimately. Because that, that's the only place we can find what is eternal in there, in the Scriptures. And what God says in His Word is what's going to give us. You know, I can't trust Miss Carol from today till tomorrow. I trust her from today to tomorrow. I mean, I'm sure she's not going to you know, do me in, you know. But... You know, because she's, uh, she's, she's earned my trust, and okay, and I'm, I'm okay, but I don't know what's going to be tomorrow. Is she going to turn her back on me? Is she going to be not with me anymore? Am I going to turn my back on her? not going to be with her anymore? You know, we're not want to fellowship with her anymore? You know, we see things change all the time. We look at the circumstances in our life. We look at the circumstances politically in this country, politically in the whole wide world. We're looking at the social uh, conditions of the world, this country, the world. You know, you just go into Africa and see the social conditions and how people live. You know, how do we get through that? How, how, and how, how can we overcome from day to day? How can we have hope? And the answer is to trust God. Because God said He's going to do something, He's going to do it. And if God says He's going to save us, and God says He's going to be with us and never forsake us nor leave us, guess what? That is what God's going to do. Because He's God. Okay, so this morning, Paul says, he talks about his, his qualifications that he has in the flesh and what he had in the flesh, by the way. And, and by the way, he had all those qualifications. He works for them very hard and he had them. But verse 7, he says, but those things, but what things were gained to me, those I count for loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of, of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is, of the, which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So it's very clear that Paul's trust is by the, is by the faith of Christ. This is what God has accomplished for him in Christ Jesus. Verse 10 says, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I have already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that which I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, 
But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So what is Paul doing? He says, I forgetting those things that are what? Behind. So, it's Paul's focus here in this passage. I'm going to show you now. Do we forget everything that happened to us in our past and just press from this day forward? Or do we forget, like Paul says, I, I, I'm forgetting those things that are behind. The things that he's forgetting that is behind is his accomplishments in the flesh. His ability to earn his, to, to earn his own righteousness. He's forgetting those things, and he's looking forward to that. There is things that Paul recalls in his ministry that happened in his past. We're going to show you this morning that he goes past, and sometimes you and I have to see where we come from, and we have to see God's salvation through those circumstances for us as we come through them and keep on praising God for that. You understand what I'm saying? Because that's what we have to do. With that said this morning, Paul says he wants the resurrection life. We, we, we've, we've talked about this before, but he wants a resurrection life. What is the resurrection life? That's when you know, this mortal has put on immortality, when this corruptible has put in corruption. Let me show by hands this morning, who of you cannot almost, almost I'm going to say almost, who cannot almost wait for the rapture or to be caught up to be taken to heaven? Who, who, who's looking forward to that day? Show of hands, okay? Who can't wait for that day to get here quicker? We all want to get there, right? We all want that life. Now, why? Because we sang that there will be no more sorrow, no more sighing. Uh, there will be no more of this flesh, of this mortal, and of this corruptible there. Because it's going to be perfect, right? So that tells me if I'm looking forward to that day, what I have right now is not perfect. Everything that's around me, right? So Paul says, but I can't wait. In this passage, he says, I can't wait. And, and, and he says, not like I've already attained. I haven't arrived there yet. But it doesn't mean that I don't want it. It doesn't mean like I don't want to live now like I have it already because I have the promises of it already. I press to that. I forget everything behind. I have no trust. I have no confidence in my ability. If I ask you this morning, says, what was your achievements over the last year that you can really be proud of and stand up? and read? I'm sure some of, you, some of us would say, oh, I did this and I did that. You know, I was great in this and I shared the gospel with that person and I encouraged that person. I, was, I did really good for the Lord this year. God says, I'm not interested in that stuff. Paul says, I forget those things. That is my, what, what God has done for me is the important, is the, is the issue here. Who I am in Him and where I'm pressing towards. Okay, that's, that's the issue. That's that I want now, okay? With that said, with everything that he has, he wants to go forward. With that said, we're going we're gonna, to, I'm um, sorry, I'm disappearing for the camera here. I want us to go back. Go back with me to Romans, first of all. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Verse 4, verse 4 says in chapter 15, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So everything that was written aforetime was, was written for what? For our learning. Does that mean I can go to some place back in time past and read something there and learn something there? Be comforted by something there? By strengthening by, by something like uh, back there? Um, that I can have hope. That brings me hope. Because let me tell you something. The same God, listen to me. The same God that is dealing with us today and is giving our salvation today and keeping us secure today and that's with us today is the same God that dealt with the nation of Israel in time past. Maybe He dealt with them differently in time past, but His promises were still true in those days and they had to trust Him for that. And they had to also, when He says to them, go forward, they had to go forward and not look back and not have their focus and their concentration and control on what is behind but they have to go what? Forward. And so this morning, I'd like to read to you, which I think it's pretty a lengthy passage, 
but I think it's something you can be encouraged by. I think it's something that you can be comforted by. I think it's something that you can have hope by. It's Exodus, the book of Exodus. Now we know when we do Bible study and we study our script by the Bible and we read the Bible and we want to understand things, we ask ourselves, when was it written? So the book of Exodus, Zechariah, was that written in time past, but now or ages to come? You with me? Time past, that's right. It was written in time past, the book of Exodus. In time past, there was the middle wall of petitioning up, and God was mainly dealing with the nation of Israel. So when I read Exodus chapter 14, He's not writing about me as a Gentile. He's not writing about the body of Christ, okay? Uh, Moses, when he's writing Exodus, is God, what God was doing with the nation of Israel, right? So I understand where it fits in. I understand what He's doing for them, and God physically is going to give them a salvation physically going to do something for them, which He's not doing for us today. And I'll focus on that a little bit later on, okay? But that was how God was dealing under here, right back in time past. In Exodus chapter 14, if you will, I'm going to read the whole passage, so bear with me. Maybe stop here and there and what have you. And be encouraged, you know, part of the public ministry is the reading of the Scriptures. So bear with me. If you say, Des, I'd rather have you preaching than read the Bible to me. I can read the Bible at home. Shame on you. I thought I have a nice reading voice that you'd like that, you know. Now, Exodus chapter 14. And we're going to see something here with God telling the nation of Israel. By the way, where is Israel right now? Israel is in Egypt. How did they end up in Egypt? How many years were they in Egypt? Was it 400 years or 400 years? Okay, they were there 400 years in, the, in Egypt, right? And they were back there, and they, and they ended up in Egypt. How? It's actually 432, but anyway, it's not going to go into the technical details of it. Plus minus 400 years, okay? Because I think Robert's looking, well, not 400, 432. <laughs> I understand. I know, yeah, okay. we, know, we get the picture, okay? So they are under, they are under, and, 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 under Egypt, and they're in bondage under e and the, the Egyptians. And the reason they end up in the, and, you know, because there was a famine in the land, and they ended up there, right? You remember uh, um, Jacob and in the whole story? But anyway, so they ended up there, so they, and God says, I'm going to let my people go, and I'm going to take them into their land that I promised them. And I'm going to make a covenant with them there in that land, and I'm going to go into a contract agreement with them when they, when they, when they prepare to go into that land, okay, which is the law. That's the Old Testament really started when he started. The Old Testament hasn't started yet, really, if you want to be technical about it. But anyway, so here we go. And the Lord spake unto Moses, verse four, uh, chapter 14, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before pi ha Hiroth, between Migdal and the sea, and against Baal-Zephon, before it, shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, and the wilderness has shut them in. What's going to happen? Listen here. Listen to the story. Listen, learn something from the Bible here. Israel is, gonna is coming out of Egypt, and they're going to get to a place where it seems to be a dead end. They're going to be trapped there. In, in Egypt's mind, Israel is trapped. There is no escape. They're cornered. And they're going to come in and overtake them, okay? So he says there, For Pharaoh will, verse 3 says, Will say unto the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land, the wilderness hath shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, says God, that he shall follow after them, and I will be, honor, be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. So, just a quick one. God's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. Let me tell you something. God had no plan before eternity passed, before the beginning of the world, to say, that man, I'm going to harden, he's not going to have a chance to be saved. Pharaoh's heart is hardened because Pharaoh's heart was hard. And God just continued to make it harder for him because he didn't give in. All right? God doesn't predestinate Pharaoh to do this for him. Okay? We, we, we're clear on that point. So he's going to harden him because of Pharaoh's hardness. Verse 5 says, And it was told the king of Egypt, that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people, and they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from, saving, from serving us? Now they realized, listen, yes, two million Jews that's just departed out of here, okay? And why did we let them go? Because they were serving us, and who's going to serve us now? Okay? And they realized it's sinking in what's happening out here, and, and, they, and they go, 
And he made, and, and, and that's just not fair, and he made ready his chariots and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots, 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 and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out from an high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them and camping by the sea beside pi Hiroth before baal Zephon. Now, by the way, what's happening here? When they overtook them, what is it meaning? They caught up with them. Okay. Verse 10, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. So now they see this. What happened? Israel is coming here. They look back. By the way, let me tell you something about the events that's happening here. It's not you and me running down here and looking back and see some two guys following us. We have two million Jews going somewhere in a direction, okay? And there must be a cloud of dust and everything is following them, what's happening. And then this Pharaoh with 600 plus chariots and horsemen and everything else, there's, there's a whole bunch of people coming behind them. It's a big deal. It's massive. It's not like we think a little, you know, when we have 1,000 people versus another 1,000 or 10,000 versus 10,000. We're talking about millions, all right? This is a big deal. And so they saw Egypt's coming in, all right? Where are we now? Verse 10, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and so they were scared. These guys were scared, man. Because they know, they left these guys, and these guys are not coming after them to come and plead with them. Hey, would you come back, please? No, what are they coming to do? They're going to force them, or, and some of them are going to get killed. You know, it's going to be a mess. So they're scared. Verse 11 says, And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? You know what he's saying to them? He says, you know, there's no graves in Egypt, so is that what you bring us out here for? So that we can die in the wilderness? Let me ask you about Esau. Where's their trust in God, what God said He's going to do for them at this stage? It's obviously non-existing. They're just looking at their circumstances. Not in what God said, right? So, um, uh, dealt with us thus to carry us forth in Egypt. Verse 12. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. So they were looking at their circumstances. They have no trust in God at this moment. They, they, you know, they just don't believe. By the way, God already made some covenants with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They know what God has promised them, a land. And they said, well, we'd rather stay in Egypt. You sometimes wonder, you know, God must be really long-suffering and merciful to His people. Okay? Verse 13, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. So what is he saying to them? He says, you know what? Stand still. Guess what? There was chaos in that camp. What is he saying to these, Egypt, to these Israelites that's now saying to him, we're going to die in the wilderness, look at what's going on. And they go crazy and running crazy out there, you know. And, and, and Moses says to them, guys, calm down. Stand still, just relax. Relax for a second here, guys. Because today, you're going to see the salvation of God. And you think these guys believed him? I'm sure they were full of doubt, you know. He says, God's going to, you're going to see the salvation of the Lord. What is God going to do for them? He's going to save them. From who? From these guys that's following them and they want to overtake them and, and take them, right? Verse 14 says, the Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. He doesn't say to them, hey guys, Israelite, Get yourself some, 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 some swords and some, some weapons and some armory. Get ready for the fight. No, he says, you just stand still. You just relax and see the salvation of God. God's going to fight for you. He says, the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Guess what? 
guys, relax. God's going to do this. It's in God's hands. He's going to take care of this. Now, I'm telling you what. That is a tall order. You have two million Jews. Okay. And you have hundreds of thousands of guys coming from behind. You know? Well, I don't know how many is exactly coming from behind, but there's a lot of people coming from behind. And you're scared. They are scared. They sore afraid. That word sore afraid. And he says, stand still. Just relax. You're going to see the salvation of the Lord today. Hold your peace. God's going to fight for you. The Lord will fight for you. Verse 15. And said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Why would God say to Moses, Why do you cry unto me? What does the word cry mean? Moses must be frantic too. He says, God, what's, your, what, what's going on here? I thought you were going to bring us out. What, what, what you? He says, why do you cry at me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go, what? Forward, not backwards. Forward, carry on with the program. Keep the course. Obviously, they blocked in. And God's going to tell him how he's going to save them, right? By the sea there. But lift up thy rod and stretch thine hand over the sea and divide it and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. They're not going to walk in a foot deep of water. God's going to part that puppy up, that sea, and they're going to walk on dry ground right through that sea, and God's going to take them and bring them right through that sea. That must be a scary thing too, because Moses puts this rod up and divides this water, and there's all technical things that we can explain about how it looked and whatever, whatever. You know, I guess it's like an aquarium. You look up here and the fishes are swimming. I don't know how that exactly, but, but I'm, just, I'm just messing with you. But, you know, it's divided, and they're going to go with dry land through the sea. Lift up thy rod and go through the midst of the sea, and be I, verse 17 says, and, and, and I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. What is he saying? I'm going to let those Egyptians follow you through the dry land. That's what I'm going to do. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon his hosts, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon the chariots and upon his horsemen. What is he, how's he going to get his honor? He's going to beat them. He's going to beat them up. He's going to destroy them. That's how he's going to get his honor. And, and, and every Egyptian from that day forward is going to know the Lord's God. And you think they would know the Lord is God already through the signs that Moses gave them at Pharaoh's temple, uh, uh, palace, right? I don't get it yet. And the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud um, went from before the face and stood behind them. Now it's not a front, it's behind them now. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them. To the Egyptians it was a cloud and darkness. But it gave light by night to, the, to, to these, so that one came, the one came not near the other at the night. So guess what? Israel could see, but it, Egypt was in darkness. It was divided. You know, God causing this all with this pillar. Where am I? 21, and Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back. So who caused the sea to go back? The Lord, right? And God, uh, 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 Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back, be a strong east wind, uh, be back by a strong east wind, and all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. So what did God use? Wind, right? And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea, and upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. So you can imagine this, you know, this is dry, this is God working here, and obviously, and, and it's dry land they're going through, and God causes this, and they went in the midst of the sea. That tells me in their mind, where were these Egypt, where was Israel going when they went through that sea, and they were in the midst of the sea, where were they? In the midst of the sea. They didn't consider themselves on land. They were in the midst of the sea on dry land, but they were in the midst of the sea. Okay. 
uh, dry land, and the waters were a wall unto their right hand, unto their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of the fire and of the, and of the cloud, and troubled the host of the Egyptians, and took off their chariot wheels, that they drave them heavily, so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the phrase of Esau, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. Not, he hasn't destroyed them yet. They're in the midst of the sea, and they're going on dry land. And what God is causing is the chariot's wheel to fall off, so the horses can't pull these chariots. It's, it's, now they're struggling. They say, wow, God's doing something here, you know. But we need to get out of here. But guess what? It's too late. It is too late for them to get out of there. And they drove them in heaven. So the Egyptians said, verse 25, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them. So, it, so something, this Egyptians knew something, that God was fighting for Israel. Who? The Lord was, right? And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, because thine are through. By the way, this didn't take place in an hour. Do you imagine two million people having to pass through that sea? It doesn't take an hour to walk through there. It's a process of a day or whatever, you know, they're going to go through there. So this is, in our minds, it's like it just happened. But these are days, this is stuff that's going to, it's a big ordeal that's going on here. And the Lord said unto Moses, verse 26, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, and the waters may come ag again upon the Egyptians, upon the chariots, and upon the horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its strength. When the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, that remained not so much as one of them. How many did he destroy? All of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them, and their right hand and their left, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. Guess what? Now after the sea is closing up and all these guys are destroyed, what happens? What happens when you die in the sea? You get washed out. And what they're seeing is corpses all over the place. Not just two or three corpses, but thousands. Because God has just won this victory for Israel. The enemy of Israel, those that had them in bondage, God's people, he's fought for them. He told them, listen, guys, we're going to get through you. You trapped your circumstances. Every one of your circumstances is contrary to you. It's against you. You and your possible mind can see no salvation for you except put a white flag up. All right? And God says to him, no, 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 no. Moses says to them, see your salvation today. And God instructs Moses, he says, you're going to do this thing, you tell the people to go forward. Trust me. And I'm sure there was not much trust until, um, until Moses touched that sea. And that water, that sea opened, and you have sea walls, water, and dry land. And they had no other choice but to do what? To go through there. And they went through there. And they saw the salvation of God, not just saving them from the enemies, but destroying utterly their enemies. Because He is God, He has the power to do so. That same God promised me salvation today. And He has accomplished that salvation for me. The same God that held up the waters by His strength and took the strength from the sea and gave the strength back to the sea when He destroyed those Egyptians is the same God that holds the waters, that brings what can destroy me, sin. Yeah, um, typology, yeah, but, you know, we don't like to do that always, but it's the God that saved Israel. There's a God that gave me salvation. Now, I don't have the same salvation today than them, but let's go read quickly there. Verse 30 says, thus, say the, thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore, and Israel saw that great work. Now, I like that two words there, great work. Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and His servants Moses. You know what, God, what Israel did? 
They go through this land, and by the way, by now they should have said, wow, wow, look at this. This is a great work that God's doing. God gets them back, and then he just destroys his, the, the enemies of Egypt too, uh, of, the, of Israel too. Then they watch out, and, go, and they see this great work that God did, and they said, wow, what a great God. Look, we saw the salvation of God. We saw the great work. By the way, the Jews live by sight. All right? And so they saw that, and they said, wow, what a great God. And they believed the Lord and His servant Moses. Because God, they did what God told them to do. They went ahead and, and went through that, and God saved them, right? Now, God's not going to do the same for you and me today. We're not going to get that physical intervention of God that He did for Israel in time past. He's not going to, when we have to run up to the river down here, and um, we have to get somebody chasing me, I can't say, God, just spot this water. I'm going to walk through there. Now, maybe you get lucky and it's low tide and you can walk through. And if you want to, you can tell people, hey, God saved me. And look, you know, no, that's just part of the tide. You were lucky at the right time. You just got lucky and you got there, you know. It's funny how people sometimes, you know, they give glory to God, but, you know, but how God do that for them, you know, it's like crazy. But anyway, so God is not going to do that for you. And today. We, 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 God deals with us not by, we, by faith. Okay, and so and God, and then the po point I wanted to bring to you is Exodus chapter 14, verse 15. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore cries thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel that they go what? Forward. Paul says, I press toward the mark. There's a course for them to go. They need to get out of Egypt. They need to get out of that land. They need to cross the sea to get to that side so that they can be where they need to be, where they need to be, get the course, right? And God says, Go forward. He doesn't tell them to look back and be taken over by your fear and fright. He says, go forward, I'm going to give you salvation. Paul says, I press towards the mark. What I thought was my salvation in time, in time past, and my time, and Paul's time past, what he thought was his salvation, was his accomplishment as a Pharisee, was his accomplishment as a, as a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as a tribe of Benjamin, and as, as, as everything like, and, and, and his zeal concerning the law, blameless. He thought that was his salvation. He says, I don't look at that stuff. And my accomplishments, I'm looking at what I'm going to press toward the mark of God, the high calling of God. I'm going to look forward. I'm going to press forward. God says to Israel, don't look back there. You were servants there. You were under bondage of sin there. Guess what was Paul, when, and, and, and when he was a, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and a Hebrew of the Hebrews, when he was, was of the tribe of Benjamin, what was Paul's condition? Ignorant in sin under the bondage of sin. Now he's no longer under the bondage of sin. He has got the true liberty that's in Christ Jesus, and he doesn't have to live in that ability of his flesh. He lives in the ability by the faith of the Son of God now. And with that, he can press forward. Israel had the promises. They were bondage, and they weren't servants, and God released them from that and, and freed them from that and says, now go forward. I'm going to give you your own land and your own liberty. Just trust me. By the way, how long did Israel's trust last? In God, after they got through that and they saw the salvation and believed God and praised Him for that, not long. We're going to see that just now. They kept, they, 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 they just, you know. By the way, when they got their freedom and they could get out of there, they said, oh, let's just rather go to, back to Egypt. Let's rather just go back there, you know. I don't want to ever going to go back to where I came from. I want to press toward the mark like Paul says here. God says, don't look back. Forget the things behind. Go forward, just like he tells us to press forward. When, when Paul says, I press toward the mark, is it Paul only that's saying that, or is it God telling me to do the same that Paul did, to press toward that mark, to go forward? That's where I need to be, to press forward. I need to press toward that resurrected life. That's what I need to focus on. Not to look behind me. Paul says, and go back with me to Philippians chapter 3 there. In Philippians chapter 3, he says, I, uh, 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 verse 13 says, Brethren, I count, myself to have, I, I, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. This is something I have to do. And what I do is I forget the things that are behind. What's the things? My abilities, what I had before. I forget those things that are behind. And what do I do? And I reach forth unto those things that are before. I want to go forward. 
Because that's what God wants for me and that's what God wants for you and I today. How many of us live in the past? How many of us listen our, in, in, our, in our abilities what we've done? And glory and bask in that. I was so-and-so, and I was there and there, and I did this, and I did this. You know what? God says, so what? Who cares? What's important is what's lying ahead of you in eternity. What is important is what God has done for you, and what God has said is important. And we're going to look at that right now. God says, Paul says, I forget those things that are behind. God says, don't look back. By the way, in the Old Testament, what happened with Lot's wife? He says, in, 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 I think it's Luke chapter 17 or something, he says, remember Lot's wife? He's talking about what's going to become in the days of Noah. Two shall be in the field, one shall be taken, one shall be left. By the way, taken is not rapture. <laughs> it's taken in death and in judgment. What did, wives, what, what did Lot's wife do when God told him to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah? Not to look back. She looked back and turned into a pillar of what? Salt. Right? And she shouldn't have looked back. God said, don't look back. And she looked back. God says, what do we need to do? Press forward. Don't look back. God says for the nation of Israel, go with me to Luke chapter 17. Or Luke, sorry, Luke chapter 9. And part of the kingdom, by the way, we come to the book of Luke again. We, we're not in uh, the Pauline epistles. We're not the but now time. But we understand where we are. And God is talking about the kingdom and about the, uh, the, 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 the requirements for the kingdom. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 62. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom. Of God. What happens when you have a plow? When a, and a plow is not like the GPS-controlled machines that Morris Chestnut, Chestnut has up there and a, a John Deere that you don't even have to sit in to plow the field. Those, what they had was a plow that was pressing by the hand and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a cow or something or an ox or a horse or something was pulling it, right? Or you're pushing it, you can push this thing. And what happens when you have this plow in the ground and you stick it into the ground and it goes? When you look back, what happens? You try to drive your car and it's like modern day. No man drives a car and looks back all the time, right? Because what happens? You go, Shh. that's what happens. You go, you don't keep the course. And for you to keep the course, you had to look straight ahead. That's where your focus needs to be. Just like the guy in the Greek races that run the race. What does the Greek racer do the race? He don't look behind him. Hey, look at how far I've gone already over this 100-meter dash. I've done 80 meters already, and I think I'm still up here. No, he doesn't do that. No, no, he's focused. He doesn't care about anybody next to him. He's in a 100-meter dash. He's just seeing the end line and finish line, and that's what he's pressing to. What is your or my finish line? Oh, it's the redemption of the body. It's the adoption and redemption of the body. It's you and I going to eternal heavens and the heavens, Right? It's for this mortal to put on immortality. It's, it's our salvation out of this world. God says, go forward. Press, forward. Press toward the mark. Live life like now and keep your eyes focused on that what's ahead of you. Okay? Paul says, like God, he says, I press toward a mark. I reach forward. I go for that. Go with me to, and I want to read you that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. You read about the running a race. And he says, you know, it's like you fight not with uncertainty. You run with certainty. You run towards the price. You run towards the line. You keep your eyes on the price. Because if you're in a race, have every one of you run some races? I've run 100 meters and 200 meters and 400 meters and 800 meters. You guys don't know what a meter is, but anyway, I guess. Yards, feet, whatever you, whatever you call it, miles, you know. But... You know, you, you run. You, you want to, especially with dashes. Verse um, 24 says, Know ye not that they which run in, a, run in a race run all, 
but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. You've got to run in such a way that you what? Obtain a prize. And everyone that striveth for the master is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself be a castaway. That word cast away doesn't mean God says, ah, I don't need you, go away. That cast away, when he means this, is I'm unapproved. Second Timothy 2.50, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. You are usable for the, for the work of the ministry. But what do you need to do? You need to keep your eye on the price. You need to keep pressing forward, okay? Israel... In Israel's history and time past, through the Old Testament, when God came into a covenant relationship and deal with them, Israel forget, forgot what God did for them. They lived in their flesh as a nation just to please themselves. They live in idolatry and they get subject to the nations of the world. They didn't look forward to what God was doing and they forgot to look back. Now here it is. We have to look back. Sometime, and, and that says my focus, when Paul says, forgetting that is behind, he says, my ability is to please God. I forget that. That I think is pleasing God. My ability is in my flesh. I put that behind me. But Paul never forgot the fact that God, by His grace, saved him that day as Paul of, as Saul of Tarsus on the way to Damascus, and God saved him by His grace. He never forgets that. He rehearses that with folks all the time. Israel had to rehearse how God saved her in Egypt when he came out of Egypt, and how God get her through the dry land, through the sea. She forgot about that. And why do we have to look back in that sense? Because we are thankful. It's going to make us thankful for what God did for us. That's going to help us keep course to what's lying ahead of us. You understand what I'm saying? How many of you this year have gone through some trials and tribulations of your own? I don't have to show your hands. Or are going through them right now. But who's, who's gone through some very difficult time and you could not see the, 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 the light of day as you went through it? It looked all glimpsy and dark and you're not going to get through this. But you place your trust in God. You trust God and you get through that. And when you look back, you now can say, Wow, that wasn't so bad. Look at God did for me here. Look how he strengthened me. I did it, actually. I could get through that. Not because of my ability, not because of who I am, not because of what I've done, but because of what Christ has done for me, because of what God is doing in me and what his word promises me. I got through that. Thank you, Lord, that you help me to keep course because I can see what you've done there in the past and you're going to do for me today and you will do for me in the day. That's how I keep course. You're not going to leave me nor forsake me. I'm going to keep the course. But you know what Esau did not? Remember that last verse? Go with me to Exodus chapter 30, uh, 14, if you will. In Acts chapter 14, Exodus chapter 14, verse 31, it says, And Israel saw the great work which the Lord, got, uh, Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. So, you know, they believed God there, but it didn't last for long. Go with me to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms. In the book of Psalms, a couple of Psalms there that I want to read to you, but Psalm 78, let's start at 78 there. When Paul says, forgetting those things that are behind, he's not forgetting what God did for him. He's not forgetting God's salvation. He's not forgetting God showing him grace and mercy at the day that he needed it and when he needed it. He's forgetting his abilities. He's forgetting his comfort. He's forgetting what he did. Okay? In Psalm 78, Psalm 78, let me find it here quickly. Psalm 78, verse 11 says, it talks about Israel. It says, they, they kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in His law and forget His works and His wonders that He had showed them. Did God show Moses, uh, the nation of Israel wonders and great works? But what did they do? They forgot it. They forget it, says, you know. 
They forgot it. Verse 42 of the same passage of the same chapter. Verse 42 says, They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. Verse 43, How he had wrought his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zohan. You know what they forgot? That day that they believed the Lord, they saw the salvation of God. God did give them salvation. God saved them. And what did they do? They forgot about it. Go with me over to the book of Psalm 106, chapter 106. And our time is done, I was almost done. Psalm 106. I was reading through this this week, and I was looking at, I was reading through Exodus this week, and I was reading through that passage where Egypt was coming, and I'm like, and I'm like, you know, they believed God. Here God gave them this great salvation. What, I mean, I'm talking about millions of people going through a dry sea and keeping it up, and then destroying the enemy who's going to kill them. What else to believe? And how can you forget something like that? But it's easy, because the focus is I now, to forget what God did. Verse chapter 106, if you will, verse 12 and 13. Then believed they his words, and they sang his praise. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel. You see that two verses? I, I encourage you to read the whole chapter, but verse 21. They forgot God, their Savior, when he had done great signs in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and terrible things by the Red Sea. What did Israel do about that? They forgot it. I want to say to you that you and I should never forget. I think the Galatians, we're starting through the book of Galatians right now. I think Galatians forgot their salvation that God gave them and how they got that salvation. And they started focusing on their own abilities and their strength. And Paul says, those things that I gain, gain. They went back to those things that Paul came back. If Paul is forgetting and pressing towards, they, they went back into the serving of the, of, of the law and stuff like that. In the book of Galatians, they forgot it too. But go with me to um, First Timothy chapter one, and I'm going to close off here, and I'm going to build and, and leave some space for me to pressing for the next week, uh, the things that we want to talk about. But First Timothy, I, I hope you guys get encouraged by some of this that you're hearing here this morning about looking at the nation of Israel and the God of Israel is the same God as our God. It is our God. First Timothy chapter one, verse twelve. This thing Paul didn't forget. What he forgot behind him, what his abilities was, what he did. But he didn't forget this thing. He didn't never forgot this. Um, verse, um, verse 12 says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy. Because when he was a blasphemer, and when he was a persecutor, and when he was injurious, when he was ignorant, when, what, what was he? A Hebrew of the Hebrews, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee, concerning the zeal of the law, blameless. But in it, that's things that you forget behind, that he was a blasphemer and a persecutor. That's what he was at that time. So he, that's his ability. He's thinking he's doing God's service, but he wasn't doing God's service. He was ignorant of what God was doing. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorant and unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation of Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I have obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Where was Paul's focus now? When he was looking back now, what is he looking back to? What God has saved him, God's salvation. He's remembering. He's not forgetting what God saved him from. And his focus is still in the spirit of the faith of Christ now. That's why he's not looking back in his abilities. He's looking back at what God's ability was, what God did for him in time past. Now he says, I press toward the mark. You with me? Now we press forward. It's easy to boast in what we do. It's easy to boast in our abilities. We actually love to boast in our abilities. We love people to know what we do. Okay, not any one of you, just me. Sometimes it's nice to, you know, hey, look at what I did. 
Without me, they could not be, never be here. If I wasn't here, possibly not even be a church here. Look at me, Des. You're good. No. No. I have to look back at what God is doing. God's salvation He provided me. God's salvation He's provided you. God's salvation he's done con- that He's done in the past. He's going to continue to do it. When Paul says to the Philippians, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, God has already provided him salvation. Just live in that. Trust God. Don't look back in your abilities. Press toward the mark. How do you press toward the mark? You understand. You remember your salvation past. You remember your salvation now. And you remember the salvation that's ultimately coming. That's how you press toward the mark. And when you do glory in the past, and you do remember the past, you remember God's salvation, never ever does anybody look back and say, oh, look at what we done. The nation of Israel did that, and did that work for them? No. They did not remember their God. And I said, you know, we're not Israel. God's not dealing with us physically. We're going to look at stuff next week that where God is not physically intervening for us, but He's, he's on, that, on that same basis, what He did for Israel on the physical basis and the spiritual basis, He's doing for us spiritually today. And we can press on. And we'll look at that next week as we finish off. All right? We're going to close off and sing. What is it? I will fly away anyway. I'm looking forward to that, flying away. Thank <laughs> you.